1971, she moved west to Oregon to, to, Oregon to work on the Ho Dad's tree planting co-op. Uh, then she lived four years off the grid at the Rainbow Farm Commune. Then she went back to Eugene. She worked on forest protection campaigns, including the famous Spotted Owl campaign. And at one time, she was the board president of the Oregon Natural Resources Council. In 92, uh, she came to Santa Fe to run the Max and Anna Levinson Foundation, which is committed to help foster a more humane and ecological world. They specialize in emerging movements and organizations and were the earliest funders of Rainforest Action Network, International Forum on Globalization, Amy Lovins, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the Post Carbon Institute, and many more. Uh, cur currently, her work is focused on the juncture of climate, energy, and activism. And some of the current grantees she has uh, uh, given this past cycle are the DNA Citizens Against Ruining the Environment, Appalachian Community Health Emergency, Center for Biological Diversity, uh, Oil Change International, Rise and Tide North America, and to local groups here, um, New Energy Economy, and uh, Wild Earth Guardians. I'm not sure if anybody's here from that group today. Um, I was going to go on about how lucky I was to have someone as incredible as Charlotte as a good friend. Uh, but since someone did it for me, I was lucky, I was lucky because I'm not there very poetic, and um, yesterday was Charlotte's birthday, and someone sent her this little email, and, I, and she shared it with me, and I stole it. Uh, but I'm going to read with what her friend Z said to her. She said, um, he said, You've become a beacon, someone who has her heart pulsing on the dangers of our ever-crashing climate, teaching in many graphic and poignant ways of a wounded earth. Your careful, thoughtful prose and pictures make me realize the interconnectedness of everything. As you grow older and more beautiful, I will continue to learn from you. And that is the thrill of knowing you, to have that glorious light shine from your doorway, illuminating the good, the bad, the scary, and the sacred. Uh, I know that some people here are already working on climate issues. Uh, at the end of this talk, we'd like to uh, open up to questions, but also if there are people who are doing some climate work, uh, and Denise and, and Marielle and some other people, um, you know, we want to have a chance for you to, to, to just tell everybody else what you're doing, and if you need support of any way, uh, you know, that'll be an opportunity for people to kind of connect. Um, we're going to try to do that briefly because we only have till about 12.15. So um, on, the 20, uh, on the second day of her new birth year, my raven friend, Charlotte Levinson. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for being here. I am your designated pinch hitter. For this morning, I've only shown this once, and it was at a meeting. It was really made for a particular meeting. Um, the way it came about was that after Hurricane Sandy, almost a year ago, I felt that I really needed to refresh what I knew about climate change. And no sooner do you start looking into climate change than you run into energy, because climate and energy, climate and energy issues overlap. Um, so it took me, actually it took me six months to make this overview of the issues and the facts and some of the responses uh, to the overlap, overlapping problems of climate and energy. And my own point of view does come through in it a lot because I um, really wasn't making it, you know, for a general audience or to try to convince people of, you know, that climate change is real or anything like that. By the way, that thing of like, do you or don't you believe in it, is completely a right-wing talking point. All of the polls show that overwhelmingly, something like 90% of all Americans not only think it's real, but think it's affecting them and our weather right now. It really is. So, you know, that whole thing of, is it true or not, just don't even, don't buy into that. That's really a diversion. But, um, okay, so this uh, is a slideshow. And it's 40 minutes long, and it just, it's just a script. I'm not, like I said, I'm not really a uh, presenter. And so um, it seems to work, though. It moves pretty quickly. I'll give a little introduction and start going through the slides. So, okay, here we go. Okay, 2012 was the year America realized the climate had changed. Records were broken for storms, fires, drought. It was the hottest year on record in the United States. The record-breaking climate events of 2012 were consistent with the forecasts for global warming. Uh, scientists became... I'm going to make this work. Okay. Hold on. Anyway, so, okay. Scientists uh, became uh, especially concerned 
Uh, I'm making myself centered here. Yeah. Okay, the record-breaking climate events of 2012 were consistent with the forecast for global warming. Scientists became especially concerned when sea ice melted faster than predicted, meaning global warming was happening sooner than they thought it would. The prime concern in global warming, or climate change, is the potential for a large rise in the level of the world's oceans, flooding coastal regions where most of the world's population lives. Climate change is a threat everywhere due to more extreme weather, including drought, mega fires, and flooding affecting people, utilities, agriculture, transportation, and wildlands. Climate change is being caused by greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere produced by human activities, especially burning fossil fuels. This finding is recognized by the National Science Academies of all industrialized nations. In particular, the scientific body known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which comprises hundreds of scientists from around the world, uh, publishes summaries of the, world's, of the world's scientific findings on climate every five or six years. Their reports are considered the definitive assessment of the risks of climate change. The soon to be released fifth report, uh, in that one the IPCC, asserts that, quote, if present trends continue, the Earth will warm by five degrees, which would add a stupendous amount of energy to the climate system. Such an increase would lead to widespread melting of land ice, extreme heat waves, difficulty growing food, and massive changes in plant and animal life probably including a wave of extinctions. So we have to take this seriously. And um, for me, it starts with coming up with an overview. So you need to understand what's going on. I know, you know, for myself, issues of climate always seem so technical or scientific, or I might have a few facts, but not really enough of a picture to feel empowered. And it's very disempowering that, you know, vaguely upsetting and depressing to know that there's this bad thing coming on and I don't really know how I can um, make a difference. So first step seemed to be uh, to, to create uh, an overview. So here's mine. This is my overview. And it starts with a look at some of the record-breaking weather events of 2012. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy became the largest Atlantic hurricane on record. Cold air diving into the backside of the trough and unusually late tropical heat and humidity coming northward out of the tropics created a superstorm. Superstorm Sandy killed at least 300 people. 50 million were affected along 900 miles of coastline. 15 states lost power. 15,000 homes were destroyed. A record storm surge of 14 feet of water flooded New York City. This is the East Village, Manhattan, New York City. This is water pouring into the New York City subway. Oh, God. City hospitals were forced to evacuate as water poured in and power failed. The evacuation continued all night. Babies were carried down flights of stairs to waiting ambulances while medical staff breathed for the infants by manually squeezing a bag to drive oxygen into their lungs. FEMA deployed 3,000 personnel to disaster recovery centers in the aftermath of the storm. Over half a million people registered for assistance. Sandy made landfall south of Atlantic City, sending hurricane winds more than 200 miles from its center. This is the Jersey Shore from Chris Christie and Obama's helicopter three days after Sandy hit.
There's still more than a thousand households in temporary shelters. Hurricane Sandy is estimated to have cost at least $75 billion. 31 million people worldwide were forced from their home by extreme weather events in 2012, according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. Record floods swamped the U.S. Midwest in April 2013. May saw a record snowfall. This is Missouri Governor Jay Nixon walking away from floodwaters after meeting with members of the Missouri National Guard in Clarksville. This is Grand Rapids, Michigan. Tens of thousands of people were evacuated from their homes in a region of eastern Germany while the swollen Danube was approaching Budapest where soldiers and volunteers built flood walls. In India, torrential rains at least three times as heavy as usual hit Hindu shrines and temples built high in the mountains. The death toll there is estimated at 8,000 people. Fire. Wildfires burned a record 9 million acres in the United States in 2012. Wildfire season is two months longer than it was 40 years ago and burns the same amount of land faster, according to Forest Service Chief Thomas Tidwell. Today's fires are becoming larger due to warmer temperatures and drought, leading to drier conditions and due to abundant fuel loads from decades of fire suppression. In 2012, fire burned close to 300,000 acres in the Whitewater Baldy Fire, the largest wildfire in New Mexico history, though only about 15% burned this severely. Wildfires impact, at, wildfires impact atmospheric conditions through emissions of gases, particles, water, and heat. Fire uh, emissions of carbon dioxide contribute substantially to the greenhouse effect contributing to future drought and more wildfire in a positive feedback loop. Wildfires are expected to increase 50% across the United States due to our changing climate and over 100% in areas of the West by 2050. By August of 2012, at least 70 large fires were burning across 13 states west of the Mississippi. Marines, U.S. Air Force Reserve, Air National Guard units were placed on fire duty. In California alone, 8,000 firefighters were fighting a dozen fires. Uh, this is aerial firefighting on the Rim Fire burning right now in Yosemite from the pilot's point of view, in a still from a six minute video posted to YouTube of what it's like flying 150 miles per hour into wildfire to drop retardant. And right now, there's over 50 wildfires burning across the United States, and the nation's firefighters have been placed on a war footing known as National Preparedness Level 5 for the first time since 2008. The Rim Fire now burning in Yosemite is the biggest wildfire on record in California, Sierra Nevada. As of uh, Friday, August 30th, it had grown to 200,000 acres, 30% contained, 5,000 firefighters, heavy air tankers, predator drone were all battling the blaze. It's an event I could never have fathomed, said Susan Skalski, supervisor of the Stanislaus National Forest. This fire hasn't behaved like any fire we have seen before here. Like other western wildfires, the Rim Fire has been consistently described as catastrophic, destructive, and devastating, yet large intense fires have always been a natural part of Sierra Nevada and many other forests. Through fire, mature, fire, uh, mature forest is transformed into snag forest, which is abundant in standing fire-killed trees or snags and patches of native fire following shrubs, downed logs, colorful flowers, and dense pockets of natural conifer regeneration. This is Yellowstone in the spring following the 800,000 acre fire of 88. The problems occur in the uh, urban wildlands interface zone. That massive plume of smoke is the Rim Fire. 
that body of water, like in the middle bottom, that body of water is Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, source of water and power for 2.6 million people in the San Francisco area. Governor Brown of California declared a state of emergency because the city's power and water infrastructure are threatened by the blaze. 300 million gallons of water a day are being removed from the reservoir to other reservoirs as a precaution against fire-related pollution and because of possible landslides and dam choking debris flows once the rainy season arrives. The city of San Francisco has spent over a million dollars buying electricity from the grid since the fire because two of the three power stations using the reservoir have been damaged. Um, in the United States, the top eight worst wildfire years were all since 2000. National wildfire fighting costs have hit $2 billion annually, could easily rise to $4 billion. Even so, according to Forest Service fire expert Bill Armstrong, the recent fires are mega events, and they are becoming beyond our ability to suppress them. The LA Times editorial board wrote on August 27th, Quote, as the rim fire rages on, the U.S. Forest Service already has exhausted its firefighting budget for the year. This isn't a sane fire policy for an era of climate change. Drought. 2012 was the most extensive drought year in history. The Agriculture Department declared the largest federal disaster zone ever. About 80% of agricultural land experienced drought in 2012. Over 2,000 U.S. counties were designated as disaster areas. Parts of the vast High Plains Aquifer, once a prodigious source of water, dropped so low that crops could not be watered. Global corn prices surged to all-time highs in 2012 as farmers plowed under scorched fields. And you probably seen this before. This is 2013 seeing continued drought with New Mexico being the hardest hit state in the country at Elephant Butte Reservoir, you know, 10 years apart. By July 2012, 20,000 record daily highs had been set in the United States. Uh, bridges spanned arid stream beds as the summer's heat wave took its toll on fish in the upper Midwest, where high water temperatures and low oxygen levels combined to kill thousands. In Minnesota, the Dakotas, Wisconsin, California, Texas, and here along the Mississippi River. The heat was blamed for at least 74 deaths across the country in a two-week period in June and July. Okay, you get the picture. What's going on here? Why are all these things happening? Um, this is James Hansen, Dr. James Hansen, uh, now retired director of NASA's Goddard Space Center for 47 years. In 1987, he told the world about global warming. He showed how its effects would reinforce one another to produce immense changes in the climate and environment. He was proved right both by science and the actual weather. He is passionate about averting climate change-related suffering. Dr. Hansen retired from the government in March. At 72, he says he feels a moral obligation to step up his activism in his remaining years. Quote, if we burn even a substantial fraction of the fossil fuels, we guarantee there's going to be unstoppable changes in the climate of the Earth. We're going to leave a situation for young people and future generations uh, that they may have no way to deal with. Global warming is closely related to the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Since the beginning of human civilization, up until 200 years ago, our atmosphere contained 275 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Now we are at 400 parts per million and rising. James Hansen's major conclusion was that if humanity wishes to preserve a planet similar to that on which civilization developed, 
and to which life on Earth is adapted, CO2 will need to be reduced to at most 350 parts per million. In 2012, Greenpeace released a report called Point of No Return, documenting 14 projects that, if completed, will take us to 1,000 parts per million. Uh, already at just uh, 400 parts per million, we're seeing increasingly intense storms, sea ice melt, expanding deserts, and extreme fire seasons. Of the 14 projects in this report, four are coal, oil, and gas projects in North America. And critically, in terms of geopolitics, the largest projects are in China, Australia, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan. Let's take a look at some projects at the juncture of climate and energy. Coal is the single largest source of emissions associated with global warming. Coal provides about 40% of the electricity used in the United States. <clears throat> this is the San Juan Generating Station in the midst of the Navajo Nation is a major source of electricity for New Mexico. Two of the plant's four units will be shut down by 2017 in a deal reached with the Environmental Protection Agency over air pollution. Nearby is the Navajo Generating Station, the largest coal-fired plant in the West, providing 90% of the power for the Central Arizona Project, the state's water delivery system. The EPA is requiring emissions reductions there. Uh, a public comment period is underway. Another nearby enormous coal-fired uh, power plant is the Four Corners plant. Southern California, Edison is 48% owner of that plant, and they are selling their share in order to comply with California's new climate and energy law. Transition is underway, but how and to what is uncertain. This is a Navajo mine located about uh, 20 miles southwest of Farmington, and it is the sole coal supplier of the Four Corners power plant. It has been for 50 years. Very all city right there. I hope I'm getting this right. The Navajo Nation and multinational corporation BHT Billiton, owner of the Navajo mine, are close to a deal in which BHP would sell the mine to the tribe for $85 million. BHP is selling off its coal assets. Their claim is that because of tax laws, the tribe can operate the mine at a profit, whereas BHP cannot. Both sides are now waiting for the operator of the Four Corners power plant that's losing its 48% shareholder, Southern California Edison, to sign a new coal supply agreement with the mine. Uh, meanwhile, Arizona Public Service said it couldn't predict the effect the commission's examination of the market might have on the power station's future operation. Very changing right now situation as, as this transition is underway, but uh, yeah, to what and, and, and uh, to whose benefit? Uh, the Black Mesa region of Arizona is the location of some of the largest coal deposits in the United States. In addition, from 1944 to 1986, nearly 4 million tons of uranium ore were extracted from Navajo lands. There is a proposal right now from a Canadian and Japanese consortium to open the first new uranium mine in 30 years near Mount Taylor, uh, even though the legacy of prior contamination remains, including over 500 abandoned uranium mines. Documented health effects include lung cancer from inhalation of radioactive particles, bone cancer, impaired kidney function, and so forth from exposure to radium nuclides in drinking. Three quarters of all people living without electricity in the United States reside on the Navajo Reservation. In April, the group Diné Citizens Against Ruining Our Environment presented a petition from women to the Navajo Nation Council stating, we are going to reclaim our minerals, our water, and our destiny for our future generations. As mothers of our great Navajo Nation, we have the right and the obligation to guide and direct the destiny of our nation for future generations. We want a future that will ensure the life-giving elements of life be preserved and protected. 
Dene Care and other Native groups have become central to the struggle over what kind of energy future there will be. In 2012, four indigenous Canadian women started what became a global movement called Idle No More to protest the exploitation of energy resources on all Native lands. Uh, the name Idle No More comes from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech he gave in 1967 in which he said, the greatest sin of our time is not the few who have destroyed, but the vast majority who sat idly by, to which this movement says, we are idle no more. Okay, this is the Powder River Basin. The Powder River Basin is on our federal public lands in Montana and Wyoming. These lands are supposed to be managed for multiple uses in the best interest of the country as a whole. The Federal Bureau of Land Management interprets this to mean leasing the land to corporations to strip mine coal. The Powder River Basin supplies half of the coal burned in the United States each year. There is no larger single source of greenhouse gases in the United States. This is one of the four North American projects in that Greenpeace report that has to stop. And, and the people who are working on it locally are wild earth guardians. Powder River Basin coal is mostly shipped to power plants in the East and Midwest. Recently, the coal industry started planning to expand exports of Powder River Basin coal through the Pacific Northwest to China and India. Transporting coal from the Powder River Basin to proposed West Coast terminal sites would require unprecedented levels of rail usage. Each terminal would receive approximately 30 miles of coal trains daily. Coal would be released into the air, land, and water from hundreds of acres of open, continuously turned over coal heaps at the terminal sites. There are concerns about train derailments, the effects of dust on human health, local water supplies, and the marine environment. Thousands have turned out to oppose the proposed export terminals in the Pacific Northwest. Organized local opposition has been the driving force behind the abandonment of export terminal plans for Coos Bay, Oregon, Grays Harbor, and St. Helens, Washington. And for the first time in history, on August 22nd of this year, the BLM held a sale for a lease of 148 million tons of, of Powder River Basin coal and received not a single bid. Yeah, that's really good. That's a real, that's a really huge, too. Uh, and the, uh, here's a quote from the uh, presumptive bidder, because, we, well, that's a whole other story. Okay. Uh, they said, we carefully evaluated the estimated economics of this lease in light of current market conditions and the uncertainty caused by the current political and regulatory environment towards coal and coal power generation and ultimately decided it was prudent not to bid at this time, said Cloud Peak Energy, the presumptive bidder. That's good. Another region that has long faced disproportionate impacts from coal is Appalachia, where coal is now mined using mountaintop removal a daily average of five and a half million pounds of explosives are being detonated directly above people's homes to blast mountains to rubble in order to reach seams of coal. Excess rock and soil laden with toxic mining byproducts are dumped into nearby valleys in what are called holler fills or valley fills. Marsh Fork Elementary School in West Virginia was located adjacent to a coal silo 400 feet downslope from an impoundment that held back billions of gallons of toxic mine waste. Ed Wiley's granddaughter attended Marsh Fork Elementary School below the sludge impoundment. Ed walked 455 miles from Marsh Fork to the steps of the Senate office building to raise awareness about the school's location next door to a coal refuse pond and to build public support for the construction of a new school in a different location. To help pay for a new school, he began a fundraising campaign called Pennies of Promise. Kids all over the country sent in their pennies. And although it took years longer than many would have liked or expected, 
Parents no longer have to worry about their children playing in the shadow of a coal plant. Massey Energy gave the county one and a half million dollars to help pay to build a new elementary school. The Appalachian Community Health Emergency Act was introduced in Congress in February 2013. If enacted, it will place a moratorium on mountaintop removal pending the outcome of a federal study to determine the cause of so many abnormal health disparities in mountaintop removal affected communities. And Maria Gounod, one of the best known leaders working to end mountaintop removal, she lives in Boone County, West Virginia, received the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2009. Bill McKibben is the founder of the grassroots climate movement 350.org. Time Magazine calls him the most important environmentalist in the world. They are shown here at the Forward on Climate rally in Washington in February. And you can see um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the background. <laughs> okay, now we're, that was coal. Now comes oil and gas. Oil is the primary source of energy worldwide and the second biggest source of, U of U.S. greenhouse gases after coal. The industry is pushing into ever more remote and challenging places to produce oil. An example is deep water drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. This is Transocean's Deepwater Horizon is the rig that drilled the deepest oil well in history at a depth of 35,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. In 2010, high-pressure methane gas from the well beneath Transocean's Deepwater Horizon ignited and exploded while in use by BP. The rig sank to the bottom of the Gulf. 126 crew members were on board at the time of the explosion. 11 were never found. Deepwater Horizon was the largest oil spill in history, unabated for 87 days. The months of spill, along with the responses and cleanup activities, caused extensive damage to marine and wildlife habitats, the economy, Gulf communities, human health. Extreme methods and lax oversight result in routine spills and blowouts wherever there is deep water drilling. In 2013, Shell's oil rig, the Kulup, ran aground near Kodiak, Alaska during a winter storm. The equipment broke, engines failed, a series of relief vessels, including the Coast Guard cutter Alex Haley, were unable to maintain control of the drifting rig. Shell Oil suspended its Arctic operations for the season after investing more than four and a half billion dollars in leases and equipment, and after the oil industry spent several years on an intensive lobbying campaign to persuade federal officials that it could drill safely in the waters of the Arctic Ocean. Standing up to the oil industry is our friend Steve Kretzman at Oil Change International, dedicated to exposing the true price of oil. Here he's being interviewed on Fox TV, including the up to $40 billion a year the oil industry receives in subsidies secured through lobbyists. Depletion. This is a California oil field. Every gas or oil well Every oil field experiences a similar life cycle. After a well is drilled, extraction ramps up and eventually declines as the well is depleted. The next well is generally a little harder to find and more expensive to produce. Depletion is inevitable. The tall red line on the left tells us that in 1930, in this country, for every barrel of oil used in the extraction process, 100 barrels were produced for use elsewhere. In 2000, one barrel produced 10. That's because the easy to get, close to the surface oil is gone. The expression peak oil refers to the calculations that show that we have already passed the halfway mark, the peak, in terms of extracting oil, and that what is left will become increasingly difficult and expensive to extract. Tar sands have an even lower energy return on energy invested than oil, and solar is catching up. Uh, we live on a finite earth that cannot endlessly give up the raw materials and energy necessary for endless growth and consumption. Ecosystem collapse, toxic pollution, war and climate change come with our globalized economic system, 
We need a new paradigm for a new economy and a new way to live. Some believe that natural gas can get us there. It's about fracking. Natural gas is found in deep underground rock formations. Hydraulic fracturing or fracking is the process of extracting natural gas from shale. Water and chemicals are poured down pipes to fracture rock, a kind of pipe bomb. The gas then escapes to be delivered to the surface. Natural gas is used for heating, cooking, electricity, fuel for vehicles, chemical feedstock, and in the manufacture of plastics and chemicals. Gas, or natural gas, is sometimes called a clean fuel because it emits half the CO2 of coal. But when released directly into the atmosphere, methane, the main component of natural gas, is 20 to 30 times more polluting than CO2. James Hansen notes, methane regulation has more short-term potential to slow climate change than does carbon regulation. Approximately 30% of North Dakota's natural gas production is burnt off in flares visible from outer space. In addition to being inefficient, the carbon dioxide emissions alone are equivalent to the annual emissions of a million automobiles. That's North Dakota. That's as bright as, you know, Dallas or D.C. And... This is a portion of the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. Each dot on the map is a well. Each line is a pipe. The prairie is being carpet bombed for energy. North Dakota oil drillers doubled record production levels between 2011 and 2013. May 13 was another record-setting month for oil output, and the boom there continues to make it one of the most economically successful states in America, with growth in employment and income that lead the nation, and a state budget surplus of $1.6 billion. There's been a huge population explosion of young men in barrack-style camps in gas boom towns. As one old-timer put it, imagine you live in a small rural town worried for years about depopulation and suddenly overnight the population doubles and the newcomers are thousands of young men without families. In grass drilling areas across the country, methane contamination of drinking water wells has been a common complaint. Recent studies from Duke University confirm their suspicions. Fracking uses huge quantities of fresh local water in the process that then must be treated as toxic waste. Some families who have been harmed by fracking and filed claims have been required to sign settlement agreements that include speaking bans. Two Pennsylvania children were just banned from talking about drilling or fracking for what appears to be the rest of their lives by the terms of a legal settlement reached between their parents, Chris and Stephanie Hollowich, and three oil and gas companies who lead drilling operations in the state's Marcellus Shale. These are areas at risk for fracking, or where fracking is going on. There's a protest in Philadelphia. In 2012, 24 states uh, considered at least 127 bills dealing specifically with fracking, according to the National Conference of State Legislatures. At least seven states have enacted regulatory laws. Vermont has become the first state to ban fracking. Uh, Josh Fox's Gaslands and Gaslands 2 are documentaries that show the gas industry's portrayal of natural gas as a clean and safe alternative to oil to be a myth and that fracked wells inevitably leak over time, contaminating the land, water, and air, and endangering the Earth's climate. After a Gasland 2's release, the companies that had leased 80,000 acres in Fox's township in the upper Delaware River Basin canceled all their leases and left. Fox said, this proves that people, organized and passionate, can actually win sometimes. We wore them down. In the grand scheme of things, this is a small victory, but it's huge. It's the upper Delaware River. In April 2013, Mora County, New Mexico, became the first county in the United States to ban all hydrocarbon extraction. Yes. Shell reportedly holds leases on an estimated 100,000 of the 1.2 million acres comprising the county. 
The Mora Ordinance also calls for a state constitutional amendment that puts community rights above corporate property rights. Tar sands. Tar sands are an unconventional source of oil that are more polluting and more energy intensive to extract than conventional oil. James Hansen, quote, if Canada proceeds to develop the tar sands and we do nothing, it will be game over for the climate. The solid orange line is the Keystone Pipeline, which carries tar sands oil, also called dill bit and bitumen, from Alberta to Oklahoma. The Keystone Pipeline already exists. What doesn't is its proposed expansion, the Keystone XL pipeline, the dotted orange lines. The Keystone XL would connect Cushing, Oklahoma, where there is a current bottleneck of oil, with the Gulf Coast of Texas for refinery and export. The KXL would also create a new section from Alberta to Kansas that would pass through the back and shale. The Keystone XL pipeline, or KXL, is a primary focus for the fossil fuels resistance and climate action movements because the pipeline crosses the entire country and because completion of the pipeline requires a presidential permit, thereby uh, highlighting the administration's opportunity to act. And because the KXL would be a major addition, adding 5 million barrels a day of capacity to a system currently moving 19 million barrels a day around the United States. Meanwhile, uh, the, the, KX, the Keystone XL pipeline builders have been given eminent domain to bulldoze private property to construct the southern portion of the pipeline, the bottom uh, broken orange line is already under construction. That portion did not require a presidential permit because unlike the northern section, the southern section is entirely within the United States. So there's no State Department involvement. This is Mike Bishop, U.S. Marine veteran shipping farmer in Douglas, Texas, and he's been trying to get TransCanada to remove the pipe it recently installed through the center of his property. Tar Sands Blockade is a coalition of affected Texas and Oklahoma residents and organizers using nonviolent direct action to physically stop construction of the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline. Protests are occurring up and down the length of the Tar Sands operations. Here, activists stopped two giant conveyor belts at a mine at the mouth of the Tar Sands in Canada. These children live at the other end, where the pipeline would bring tar sands to refineries located in poor communities in Houston. Stopping the Keystone XL and resisting fossil fuels is a focus for environmental justice groups as well as climate activists. In February, 40,000 people rallied and marched against the Keystone XL pipeline in Washington. At the podium, native chiefs whose territories lie along the proposed route of the pipeline addressed the rally. Chief Jackie Thomas of British Columbia said, never have I seen white and native work together like now. The Reverend Lennox Yearwood, CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, compared the rally to the 1963 March on Washington for Civil Rights. The protest was organized by the Hip Hop Caucus, 350.org, Idle No More, and the Sierra Club. Extensive network of pipelines already exists. Pipes, as well as all conveyances of oil, are prone to spills. Estimated 200,000 gallons of crude oil spilled after an Exxon pipeline carrying Canadian tar sand oil ruptured in central Arkansas in April. Online media inside climate news reporters won this year's Pulitzer Prize for national reporting for their work inside the biggest oil spill you've never heard of, investigating the million gallon spill of Canadian tar sands oil into the Kalamazoo River in 2010. The Pulitzer Committee commended the reporters for their rigorous reports on flawed regulation of the nation's oil pipelines. Proposed solutions. The London Array, the world's largest wind turbine installation. 
Wind energy became the number one source of new U.S. electricity for the first time in 2012. Alternative energy is an important step away from fossil fuels, but ultimately it is impossible to fuel endless consumption on a finite planet. 2012 was also a historic growth year for the solar industry. Electricity from solar voltaics is easily decentralized and useful in a wide variety of settings, such as here in Pakistan. You may have heard of Germany's big rise in its use of solar rooftops. Germany plans to get 80% of its electricity from renewables by 2050, but at the same time, record amounts of coal are being imported from the United States to guarantee an ample supply of electricity in the interim, and there's controversy about the cost to nature and agriculture of the extensive use of biomass in the plant. Partnership was formed between Santa Fe County and New Energy Economy to solarize the Tisuki Fire Station, among other projects. <laughs> in general, there are two different strategies when it comes to dealing with climate change. We can try to stop future warming, called mitigation of climate change, or we can find ways to live in our warming world, called adaptation to climate change. Adaptation involves developing ways to protect people and places by reducing their vulnerability to climate impacts. An example of adaptation would be communities building seawalls to protect against sea level rise. Another example of adaptation is to relocate to higher ground. Mitigation involves attempts to slow the process of climate change by lowering the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Planting trees that absorb CO2 from the air is an example of mitigation. The capacity and potential for humans to adapt is unevenly distributed across different regions and populations. California's Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, known as AB 32, is a state law that, quote, fights climate change by establishing a program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all sources throughout the state through incentives, regulations, market mechanisms. Their goal is to reduce California's greenhouse gas emissions 25% statewide with mandatory caps for a significant source is California leads the nation in energy efficiency, but is still the 12th largest emitter of carbon worldwide. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative was the first cap and trade program in the United States. Cap and trade means setting an upper limit, the cap, on the amount of greenhouse gases that can be released into the atmosphere. Every year the cap is lowered. Permits are then issued for the greenhouse gases that are still allowed to be released. The permits are bought, sold, and traded on a carbon market. That's the trade part of cap and trade. The Northeast cap and trade agreement states showed greater reductions achieved over 10 years in the country as a whole. Reductions were due to slower economic growth, switching from coal to natural gas, electricity, and better efficiency. However, getting to 350 parts per million requires an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas pollution, and the U.S. average was only 13% after 10 years. There's a revival of interest in small and simpler units for generating electricity from nuclear power. The federal government has put up half a billion dollars in development subsidies for small modular nuclear reactors. Many are in development, none have been built. Some scientists, notably Dr. Hansen, are very much in favor of SMRs, which are safer on paper than conventional nukes. Energy expert Amory Lovins believes that they will never be cost competitive and that any money spent on them is money that would have gone farther toward preventing carbon emissions if spent on energy conservation, wind, or solar. After a three-year campaign by tens of thousands across Los Angeles, Mayor Antonio Villarigosa joined Sierra 